Howdy folks, welcome back to CS128 Honors. Today we're going to be talking more about threads and how to message within threads in Rust. Okay, so we're going to briefly review how to create some threads um, using thread spawn, then talk about the motivation behind passing messages with threads. Um, we'll go back to the theory from last class about parallelism in this. Then we'll introduce some basic and advanced message passing in Rust. So hopefully this will be a very example heavy lecture um, to prep you for MP3 uh, next week. MP3 goes more into multi-threading, message passing, splitting up computations into smaller, smaller parts. So hopefully this lecture and the next one will help you get set up for that. Okay, a couple of quick reminders. Uh, homework nine is due on the 11th at midnight. Homework 10 will be releasing today due on the 13th at midnight and uh, mp2 is due next Tuesday at midnight. Okay, let's go over spawning a single thread. So remember you can use this thread spawn from the standard thread crate. Um, you spawn this thread using what's known as a closure. So these double uh, vertical bars and then the curly braces. You can write whatever code you want in here and then um, this thread will be created and it'll print out hello from another thread. And then thread spawn returns what's known as a join handle and then we can wait for our thread to finish by calling join on our join handle. Um, this join handle will return okay. Uh, we're not gonna do anything because our thread finished successfully. If join returns an error, that means your thread panicked. So maybe you unwrapped an, uh, a non value, unwrapped an error value, whatever it may be, E here will be the, the reason why your thread panicked. And so you can print that out and sort of debug with that. Okay, um, this is fairly straightforward. So I wanna just briefly review a couple of concepts from last time. So we have this notion of blocking functions. So blocking functions will stop the current thread until that function returns. So if we go back to this example, join is a blocking function. It will block the main thread while this other thread is running. Okay, and we have our join handle. It's a struct that sort of gives you this permission to join a thread. Um, so you call join on this join handle and join will block. So it blocks the program until the thread terminates. Um, you get your join handle from thread spawn. So thread spawn spawns a single thread and returns the join handle that is associated with it. So. Like I said, you call join to block the current thread until the thread finishes. And like I mentioned in the example, if the thread, if the thread panics, you get an error on uh, join. Otherwise, you get OK after the function is finished blocking. OK. So um, then we introduce this move keyword. So what move does is it sort of takes data from the main thread, from the outside thread, and passes it into my thread. So I have my variable i that's in the main thread, in my main method, and when I say move, I take a snapshot of i, so I copy i and put a, put a copy inside my thread. Um, so that way, I have sort of two copies of i, one copy that exists in the main thread, and one copy that exists in this new thread. Um, and then I go to the next iteration of i, and I create another copy of i, uh, by calling this move. And then we said we can keep track of all of our handles in a vector, um, you know, push each handle to a vector, and at the end of our program, or at the end of our main method, we call join on every one of those handles. So um, the big thing is the move keyword. Move keyword allows you to move primitives, um, and it will copy them over for you. Okay, then we introduced um, cloning non-primitives. I don't believe there's an example in the last lecture, so here it is. So same program, uh, we have our handles, but this time our data is a string, capital S string. It's not a primitive type, it's a struct, and so we're not able to copy it. So we do the same thing, we uh, call thread spawn, push our handle, and join at the end. But in this case, we're making a clone of our data. So we call data.clone for each iteration of the loop. So we have a cloned copy for each thread, and we're moving the cloned copy into our new thread. So remember, threads have ownership of the variables defined inside them. And so um, 
we always want main to have ownership of data because if we move data from the main thread into a new thread, well, the next thread we try to create will not be able to access data because main no longer owns it. So we create this clone and move ownership of data clone into the new thread. And so we're always able to clone data so we can create 10 different threads. Each of them have their own clone of data. Again, we use this move keyword to sort of move ownership of data clone into this new thread. Okay, so like I said, we use the move keyword to move data. Um, move means either transfer ownership of the data or copy that data if it's a primitive type. And so remember, call.clone on any data type that cannot be copied. So any sort of advanced data type that's not primitive. Then you're gonna pass the cloned copy to the new thread. Okay, so we talked briefly about the sort of theory behind parallelism last lecture. Uh, parallelism is basically you split up your computation into different parts, and then you create a thread to solve each part at the same time. So you can have a bunch of different threads sort of working on the same problem as your program goes, and so you can speed up this execution rather than solving your program at once with one thread. You have multiple worker threads working on your problem, so you, allowing you to solve it quicker. And then at the end, you can combine the results um, if this problem is something that needs to be sort of combined and aggregated at the end. And so in all of the past examples, we always just sort of sent some type of uh, value into a thread and then printed that value out. We never actually combined the results that our threads produced at the end. And so we want our threads to be able to communicate their results back to the main thread somehow. So this allows us to sort of combine any solution to a problem. Um, so this lecture will show you how to send messages from your threads back to the main thread. Okay, so I'm gonna briefly go over what this is gonna look like and then show you some code on how to do it. So suppose that we have this little main thread here um, and has this large piece of data and uh, we wanna split this up and then you know solve it really quickly and uh, return some result. So we could just take this data, solve data like with the entire piece, and then return that away. But we're programmers who want to use threads, and we want to make this really efficient. So what we're going to do is we're going to split up our data into three different parts. Um, we could use more. Um, the number of threads you do decide to use is very empirical. Um, using a thousand threads is too much and there are some sort of overheads with that so it's a bad idea to use a thousand so um, the number you do pick is really just sort of um, guess and check it's empirical you can sort of study that anyways so we're going to split our data into three parts but we want to convert this to an owned value so we want it to be completely separate from the main data so if this is a vector we want to create a new vector from that, not a slice. So we'll create a slice and then uh, you know, convert that to an actual vector like using two vec. Uh, you'll see an example of this later. And so I'll touch more on why we want an own value in just a bit. But having an own value here is very important. Okay, then we're gonna create our threads, one thread for each sort of sub piece of data. And then we're gonna move ownership of this subpart into the thread. So this is where um, converting to an owned value matters. The main thread is always gonna own data and we cannot have multiple owners of a single piece of data. So um, we're not able to sort of move data into you know, multiple threads at a time. Um, so that's why we create copies and then owned copies. So like this, piece of data has one owner, we move ownership to thread one. This piece has ownership, we move it to thread two. Um, we're unable to move this large piece of data into both thread one, thread two, and thread three due to these ownership rules because data can only have one owner. Okay, so we perform this move using the move keyword in Rust. And then each thread is gonna perform some computation and give us a result. So. Now we're at the stage where we have our results in our threads and we want to combine them somehow. 
So what we can do is we can send some messages back into the main thread. It'd be like, this is our result. Um, it's now your job to deal with that and do whatever you'd like with it. So the main thread will then take some type of combining function, um, sum it together, merge it together, whatever it may be, and then return the final result. Okay, so this is the general sort of architecture you'll see in uh, MP3 in uh, MapReduce. And it's sort of the, the pattern we're going to be showing you in some examples today. Okay, so how do we actually send these messages back uh, between threads? How do we perform this little sending back to the main thread? Well, to communicate between threads, we can do one of two things. One, we can use shared memory. So we can allocate some memory and uh, have that shared between threads. And you might be wondering, I just said that this isn't possible. Well, it's very hard in Rust. There are certain things you can use in order to use shared memory, but there are some sort of overheads and costs with this. So this will be a topic for a lecture uh, next Thursday, but this is possible, it's just somewhat difficult. You can also pass messages between threads. So this is what today's lecture is about. So in Rust, we can pass messages with what's known as the MPSC sender and MPSC receiver. So you can create a sender and receiver using this function called MPSC channel. It opens up a communications channel between multiple threads. So when we call MPSC channel, we're given a tuple. Um, the first element in our tuple is a sender, and the next element is a receiver. And you'll notice that uh, both sender and receiver have this generic type. And this generic type has to be the same for both. So this uh, sender is going to send a string, and this, so this receiver knows to sort of listen for strings. Um, these two types cannot be different. If they are different, your code will not compile. So uh, fair warning. OK, so then we follow the same pattern. We call thread spawn and call move and we're moving ownership of the sender into our thread. So this thread becomes the sending thread, and our main thread is going to be the receiver. So we call send, we're sending this message that's a string, um, and we're going to you know, print out that there is a message from our thread, and then in the main thread, we're going to call receive. So let's see what this actually looks like. I said we have this tuple created from MPSE channel and uh, move ownership of the transmitter or the sender into the thread, uh, print out a message that we've sent from the thread, and then finally receive a message. Okay, okay so we've sent a message, uh, sent message from thread, and then um, our main thread unwraps and receives that message. So our main thread prints out, we got this message, hello there. Okay, um, seems straightforward enough. This gets more complicated when we have more threads though. Remember from our sort of, um, this little you know example here where we want to have a bunch of threads and then you know, set each thread sends a result back to the main thread and combines it. Well, having multiple threads does make things a little bit trickier. Okay. So first, I want to talk about what MPSC means. So MPSC stands for Multiple Producer, Single Consumer. So in Rust, the MPSC module provides this sort of message-based communication using a channel. So you call the channel function to create your channel, which is a sender and a receiver. So senders are these clonable um, objects that you know, allow a bunch of threads to send messages simultaneously to one receiver. So let's unpack that. Um, clonable, well, okay. We can create multiple producers by cloning the transmitter. Um, what cloning the transmitter does, it says, I'm going to have this other copy of a transmitter that can send a message to the same receiver. So you have a bunch of these cloned transmitters 
and they're all going to send messages to one receiver. Hence, the multiple producer, single consumer. So you're going to call clone on the transmitter, the, the TX, and move the cloned TX to a new thread. Remember, we don't want to lose ownership of the TX, so we can clone it for subsequent um, thread spawns. Similar to the same way like you, you uh, clone this string in the past example, you're not able to copy transmitter, so you call clone, and if the clones copy to your thread. And you're going to send your messages within your threads, and finally receive messages on the main thread with your receiver. So uh, just a side note, you'll often see TX used as a shorthand for the sender or the transmitter, and RX used for the receiver. Um, this is pretty much a... Uh, sort of, I don't know, a rule or an un, un, unofficial rule for any sort of communications or messaging context. So TX is transmitter, RX is receiver. Okay. So another thing you might have noticed is there's no join handle in this code. So how is that actually possible? We, we covered in the last lecture that you need your join handle to wait for your thread to finish. Well, Something kind of cool about receiver is receiver will block the current thread of execution until it either receives a message or all transmitters go out of scope. So um, receiver will sort of keep waiting until it gets a message or it gets this notification that all the transmitters have gone out of scope and um, they're not able to send any messages anymore. So when all transmitters go out of scope, this means there's no more messages to receive since there are no more senders to send messages. So Rust has built in this really neat technique to stop listening for messages when it knows that there's no more senders for it, which is a super, super powerful technique that we're going to take advantage of in the next few examples. So why does this mean we don't have any join handles? Well, all transmitters are going to go out of scope when the threads that own them finish and uh, receive is going to keep receiving messages until all transmitters go out of scope. So we have this code that blocks for you until all threads finish and all the, th the transmitters are dropped. So as long as you drop transmitters at the end of your threads and you call receive in the main thread, receive is equivalent to join handle dot join. So receive will block for you so you can take advantage of that instead of calling join on your join handles. So let's see an example of sort of receiving multiple threads. So we follow the same procedure. We uh, create a channel for communication. We're going to create a new thread. We move the transmitter into this new thread. So we're going to send our first message, hello. Then our thread's going to sleep for one second. Send another message, sleep again. Send another one, sleep again. Finally, send the last message. And at the end of this thread, transmitter is going to go out of scope. And so when transmitter goes out of scope, this signals receive that transmitter has gone out of scope. There's no more messages to receive. So once you've received all the messages and you get this notification that transmitter is out of scope, you can stop, stop this loop and uh, end the program. Okay. So, uh, same example, we create a thread, send a bunch of messages, we're going to wait. So you'll notice that receive is going to block for us. So it receives one message, keeps blocking, receives another, keeps blocking, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we got our first message, second, third, fourth. And you'll notice that our program finished when the last message was received. And so what this while let syntax does is it says while there is either, so while this receive returns a message, continue this loop. So while receive gives me a pattern similar to match, it uh, gives me an okay pattern, I'm gonna continue running this loop. And so receive is gonna block, and then when receive returns, this loop is gonna look that the result is okay. If the result is okay, we can print out our message once receive returns an error, we're going to exit this loop. So receive will return an error. 
when tx goes out of scope. So the thing to note here is it's not really a uh, logical error, it's, it's intended, it's part of the API. You get an error when all transmitters are out of scope. So super powerful. Let's run that again. You notice our thread is blocking. And finally, when you know the transmitter goes out of scope, receive returns an error, and our program finishes. Okay, let's see another example. Actually, uh, briefly touch on this like while let uh, syntax. So while let some pattern equals some expression, you do something. So um, this allows you to loop while some expression matches the pattern. Uh, notice I used match. These are these patterns are similar or exactly the same as what you've used in match statements. So the important thing though is pattern does not have to be exhaustive. It's just a single pattern. So um, while some expression gives you a pattern, you continue, and then you break when the pattern does not match your expression. Okay. So we've covered sort of um, passing multiple messages, passing a single message. Now we have multiple threads passing multiple messages. So we start a program like any other by creating our channel. And we're going to create 10 different threads. But the first thing you'll notice is we're cloning our transmitter. Like we said in the past, cloning our transmitter allows us to pass in a copy, so multiple producers and they're all gonna send messages to one receiver. Okay, so we pass our cloned copy um, into our thread, and then we're gonna say, uh, send 10 messages per thread back to the main thread. So our message is message i from thread, thread index. Um, and then we're gonna use the cloned transmitter to send messages. So send the message and then continue on to the next iteration of our loop. We have the same while let pattern that uh, looks at you know, what the message is and finishes when we get an error. So I want to point out that this code is buggy, and you'll see why in just a couple seconds. OK, so we have this code here. Um, you know, same thing, channel, uh, clone the transmitter, spawn our thread, send a message, and this while let receive. So let's run that. Okay, so we've got a bunch of messages. Um, I believe it's 100. Message 0 from thread 0, message 0 from thread 1. And you'll notice um, there's no sort of ordering. Threads can run at the same time as each other and overlap. So thread 1 sends, a, sends messages at the same time as thread 2. 1 and 2 overlapping here. Um, Let's see, you got no overlaps after, but our program hasn't finished yet. So this tells me receive is still waiting. Why would receive be waiting? Well, we said receive will exit when all of the transmitters have gone out of scope. When all of your threads have gone out of scope, they drop the cloned transmitter. But this transmitter is still in scope. Remember, we're passing the clone into the threads but TX, the, the original transmitter, is still in scope. So receive is still waiting for messages from the original transmitter, but there's no messages to be sent. So we can get a, around this by ex explicitly calling drop on transmitter. So we're saying force TX to go out of scope so that our program will sort of behave as expected and quit when all of the cloned transmitters go out of scope. So this line is super, super important. Drop TX, so make TX go out of scope so that our program will finish. So let's run this again. There we go. We got 100 messages and our program went out of, or our program finished immediately. Um, because TX is on a scope, you know, once these clone transmitters go out of scope and we've received all of our messages, receive will return an error and our program can exit. So this drop is super, super, super important. If you want to use multiple threads and have multiple transmitters that are cloned, make sure you drop TX. We'll see some other strategies on how to sort of structure your code. Um, 
so that uh, in, in these strategies you, you don't need to call drop yourself. But um, for now, if you have threads and receive in the same sort of scope, in the same function, make sure you call drop on the original TX. Okay, uh, this is a quick callback to ownership rules. So, a reminder, receive returns error when all transmitters have been dropped and all messages have been received. Transmitters are dropped when they go out of scope. So when your thread finishes, the clone goes out of scope. Or when you call drop on that transmitter. So two ways for transmitters to go out of scope. Um, we saw in the last example, it's super, super important that you call drop so that this original TX that is never moved out of scope uh, is dropped and so your program behaves as expected. Okay. So I should note that Rust will automatically call drop for you when variables go out of scope, but you can do it ahead of time if you wish. So this is sort of Rust's memory management in action. Um, this drop function is called for you on every sort of variable out of scope, but um, so you don't need to worry about it normally, but in this case, uh, this is where you sort of have to pull back the curtain, do it yourself. Okay, so let's do some real computation now. Rather than just sending some messages, let's uh, do some real work. So we have a bunch of numbers here. Um, we're gonna say we're gonna have vectors of 10,000 numbers, and we're gonna have 10 threads. So 100,000 numbers, our max data is gonna be 100,000. Um, this data is a vector from zero all the way to 100,000. So this is our large piece of data, and what we're gonna do is sum this data uh, across all threads. So we uh, make our transmitter, make a transmitter and a receiver, um, start our threads, and this code here, don't worry too much, is uh, creating a subvector. So for thread zero, we have zero to 999, or 9,999. And then uh, thread one is from 1,000 to 1,999, and so on and so forth. So if you recall back to that diagram, I said we want owned copies of this subvector. So we're taking a slice of data and then converting it to a vector. So owned subvec is completely separate from data. They're two different entities now. Owned subvec is not a reference. It's not a slice. It's its own vector. Okay clone our transmitter, and then we move ownership of own subvec and the cloned transmitter into our thread. So we uh, iterate over our subvector, sum it up, and then send that sum back to the original thread. We call drop, and then when we receive messages, we take a, a tally of, or take a sum of all the received messages, and then we can print that out later. So same code, um, we're just gonna add some printing and then uh, at the end we print out our total sum. And just for correctness, uh, we're gonna make sure that the total that we get from all of our transmitters is the same as just summing data up. Okay, so uh, well, big takeaway from here is threads will run at different times, so you'll receive messages um, at a different time than other threads are sending, so you have no ordering of the you know the threads running. Um, but at the end, we get this sum, and uh, our code does not panic, so this assert is good. Nothing's our, our code is behaving correctly. Um, we have each thread. We're gonna calculate the subvector sum and then send a message. So our receiver is gonna get some value. And then this loop exits when all of our threat or all of our transmitters have gone out of scope. We're already dropping the original transmitter, so we're good there. And so our program finishes and prints out the total sum um, once uh, receive returns an error. Okay, so super example heavy lecture. Um, hopefully this gives you sort of a good understanding of messaging. We'll have more examples and we'll sort of uh, reinforce these concepts in the next lecture. And that'll hopefully get you prepped for MP3. All right, that's all folks. Take care.